Birmingham in Brazil, where for the first time ever, Headbangers Ball is coming to you from South America. And of course, for us to be here, it's got to be a truly auspicious occasion, and it is. Iron Maiden are celebrating their 20th anniversary with a brand new album, The Best of the Beast. And that's exactly what you're going to get tonight. Interviews, videos, and live performances from here in Sao Paulo, and an Iron Maiden documentary. So for everything you ever wanted to know about Iron Maiden, but were too afraid to ask, check out The Best of the Beast from Brazil with Headbangers Ball. The devil sends the beast with wrath because he knows the time is short. Let him who hath understanding reckon the number of the beast, for it is a human number. Its number is 666. I left alone, my mind was blank. What I saw that night was real and not just fantasy Just what I saw in my old dreams Were the reflections of my woman staring back at me Cause in my dreams
dark room And the pain walks Headbangers Ball is coming to you for the first ever time from Brazil. We're celebrating the best of the beast with Iron Maiden, their 20th anniversary. And first up tonight, I'm joined by Steve and Dave. And it's lovely to um, be here. We're so excited to be in Sao Paulo. Um, how is it for you? Because this is a very um, strong territory. You're headlining Monsters of Rock. Is it good to be back? Yeah, it's great. When we first came in in 85 with uh, Queen and Rock and Rio thing. And then we come back uh, four years ago and headlined our own shows, isn't it? And it's just so strong for us here. The fans are really crazy. So it's, it's great to come back here. Well, I think we're going to see a little bit of that later on. We're going to show some live performances. But today's show, tonight's show, is going to be a little bit of a walk down memory lane, just so you know. Um, because we, we want to like really go right back to the beginning and actually start in 1976 when, when you formed the band. And I just wondered, um, did you have a clear vision of what you wanted Iron Maiden to sound like? And did you have any long-term game plan? Well, I just wanted the band to um, have lots of aggression, play fast, music with lots of melody um, and lots of time changes you know because our influences I suppose were really you know stuff like Sabbath and Purple the obvious ones and Zeppelin and stuff but also really like Wishbone Ash and, and uh, Genesis and Jeff Toll and stuff like that so just try to combine all those sort of elements in the band really and uh, I think we you know fairly well achieved that really because uh, you know there's a lot of elements of those bands in there you know without sort of ripping them off it's just uh, you know, I think we've got our own sound, but Excellent. definitely strong influences. Excellent. And Dave, can you remember like a pivotal point in Iron Maiden's career when you suddenly thought, my God, this is really beginning to happen? Yeah, I think back to that time in the mid 70s when we were playing like the clubs and, and pubs and you're looking at, you know, the pub next week or the club. And I remember we actually um, we'd done about four or five nights at the Marquee and, like, and sold them out right. and to me it was like that because that was always the, the club the prestigious yeah. you know place to play so I thought this is it we made it <laughs> we played headline like and then next stage it's right let's play Hammersmith Odeon or that's you know so it kind of branched out from you know from the clubs into the right. theatres right. then into like the arenas and then from England actually moving out across Europe mm -hmm. and eventually to America Japan so it started off from the pubs to the whole yeah. world and now, yeah, like 20, yeah, 20 years, you know. And now, 20 years, you're headlining here in uh, Sao Paulo in front of 70,000 rabid fans, which is a fantastic achievement. Um, are we actually going into the video for Number of the Beast, um, which of course has got Bruce Dickinson on vocals. Um, what's your kind of strongest memory of that era of Iron Maiden's um, career? Well, that album really sort of. Uh turned a lot of pages for us because I mean before that we'd, we'd done very well in the UK and we started to headline our own shows uh, in 81 as well um, after doing a tour with Kiss in 80 in, around Europe but uh, worldwide beast you know seemed to sort of break us because we had number one in the UK and from there it spread just you know everywhere and so that the actual song um, seemed to become you know a real uh, standard track for us yeah and I mean even now we still play it in the set and uh, it's a song that everyone loves to hear so you know, it's um, it's stood well at the test of time. The TV support, which makes it an even more extraordinary achievement. How do you explain um, the phenomenal success? Is it the touring? Is it the fans? Is it a bit of both? Or? Yeah, I think we kind of build up a cult following um, in in England and stuff at the, in the beginning. And it was really, it's been from touring. I think we've done about ten world tours now, and they've been like long tours. You know, ten months, and, and one of them was like thirteen month tour. So really, it's like out of the hundreds and hundreds of gigs we've done over. The years i think that's that's been the strength because um you know we haven't been play, played on the radio very much and um so it's been going out there and taking the music to the fans and i think you spread like word of mouth you know they tell one friend they come down so you know that and probably like through magazines and, and it's kind of got the band across and i think also like the music we've kind of stuck by what we believe in right. and play and we've never actually you know become like commercialized you know accessible for for the radio it's just do what we, we feel and I think the kids believe in it, and that's why they're stuck with us over this. I think that's a very good point, particularly in these times when the trends come and go. So, um, actually, Steve, if I can ask this one to you, you have had several lineup changes over the years, and I was wondering, um, although it must have see, uh, seemed a little bit upsetting, unsettling at the time, do you look back on those lineup changes and see them as a, like a positive kind of growth for the band? Yeah, I think you've got to look forward. I think, you know, whenever someone leaves, for whatever reason, you just have to make sure that the, the change is a positive one. And... Uh, if you start worrying about the past, and, and we have a fantastic history, but 
you've got to look forward and you're only as strong as your next album so uh, whoever happens to be in the band at that time you've got to make it the, the best album you can make and uh, I think when you do get new blood in the band I think it just it gives the band a kick you know because uh, the enthusiasm alone is uh, definitely a lift you know well, thank you for that. Um, right now, though, we've got to go to our first short break. And uh, taking us into that break, uh, we're going to show you some exclusive footage from Monsters of Rock in Sao Paulo. Uh, I'm Maiden headlining here in front of a sold-out capacity crowd. Here we go. Check it out. See you after the break. And uh, after that, we're going to talk um, to the guys about their new compilation album, The Best of the Beast. Some 
The Beast is out on the 23rd of September. And uh, Steve, um, could you tell us a little bit about the album? Why did you decide that the time was right to release a compilation? I know it's your 20th anniversary, but had fans been coming to you and saying they were ready for it? Um, not so much. It's just that uh, we thought after 20 years, if we don't get one out now, it's going to, you know, we have so many songs to choose from, we, uh, we'd have to put out, you know, quadruple, which we've done a quadruple with vinyl, but uh, the CDs are double and we've also got a, a single one as well. And what we've tried to do, we've got the, the single coming out so that if people 
don't really want to buy the you know the album if they've got everything already then they can just get the single right. uh, we've tried to cater for everybody so there's a single album for people who maybe just like one or two maiden songs and, and not really got into the band much before prefer a single album then you've got the double album and then you've got the quadruple album for really for the collectors uh, you know and we has got the sound house tape stuff and that all on, on there so we try to cater for everybody I mean right. you know you can't completely uh, keep everybody happy but well we're going to um, check out the European premiere of the new track you can find on Best of the Beast it's a song called Virus, which um, I understand was kind of quite a group effort um, in the songwriting department. Um, now, I understand it's a little bit of a, a dig at the media in the UK. Could you tell us um, about this, the new yeah. song Virus? Well, yeah, I mean, the, um, it's, yeah, it's sort of tongue-in-cheek uh, dig at them, really. They've been sort of uh, having a bit of a dig for quite a while now, so we thought we'd have a dig back. Good. And, uh, <laughs> you know, it's just, uh, it was a song that we wrote fairly quickly really because uh, it was just in a you know a couple of hours we just it was the first time we've actually written together with four of us I mean Nick doesn't write anyway so uh, we just went in and decided to go in and you know with no idea what to do beforehand we just came out with that and it was it's, it's really really strong it's turned out great I mean another time we might have gone in there and been in there for a week and come out with nothing but it, that's the way it goes but it worked really well so we're really happy with it and uh, it's a very strong song it's, it's not particularly a commercial song or anything it's like a six and a half minute song um, but it's it's a good song, I think so, yeah. Well, let's check it out. Here we go, the European premiere of Iron Maiden from the album The Best of the Beast. This is Virus. This is the packaging. Uh, could you tell us a little bit about um, what they're going to get with the CD if they buy it on the 23rd of September? Well, you get on the uh, double CD, you get uh, like a thick booklet that's about 60 pages or whatever, over 200 photographs. And uh, if you get the vinyl, I think it's like a 48 page booklet. And it's just. Uh, fantastic packaging really for a fan I think to, I think it's part of the fun of getting a new album is like looking through all the stuff you know I remember you know, albums I've bought in the past of bands that I've really liked that you know part of the fun is actually looking at all the lyrics and checking out the different photographs and the, the thank you list and this and the other and, and st stuff so uh, there's a lot of stuff in there there's everything by the kitchen sink in there and it's, it's great you know because you've got the you open it up and the CDs on in, you know like uh, picture disc kind of CD and it's, it's really good. Yeah, and there's an Iron Maiden family tree and tour diaries and a list of every single gig Iron Maiden ever played. So that must take up quite a few pages of the book. So is that kind of um, it's kind of like a walk down memory lane, really, isn't it? Both the packaging and the album. Yeah, I mean you can get you know, a bit nostalgic about it. I mean, imagine once you sit down and look back at all, all those dates and have a real chance to look at the book there and and read some of the stories. I mean, it's probably stories you know we've even forgot about, you know, so because I haven't seen the whole complete finished thing. So, yeah, it would be like a walk down memory lane and um, I'm looking forward to actually putting all the tracks on, listening to them and it kind of takes you back to that period. So each song will take you back. I mean, going right back to the Sandhouse tapes. I mean, you know, it, 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 you know, you can remember that whole that whole period and era. So, yeah, definitely memory lane time. Folks. Does it put a bit of a perspective on it for you guys, um, thinking how much you've achieved? It does when you think back to the Sandhouse tapes, because we, <laughs> cause we, uh, we recorded that in 78, uh, New Year's Eve going into 79, and uh, that's the reason we recorded it, because we didn't have any money, and no one else wanted to record at that time, so, and uh, we didn't have anywhere to stay, and it was only the fact that uh, Paul met this uh, girl and uh, whatever, and she invited us to his party, we crashed out, of the, <laughs> crashed out of the party, didn't we, because right, we had yeah. nowhere else to stay, but... So, so you remember things like that and you know yeah. it sort of does put things in perspective you know yeah. i mean even yeah. like we, we couldn't actually have uh, afford to buy the, the two inch master as well because you know <laughs> we just barely afford petrol and pay for the recording session so um so that was it you know so when they had to you know the way they digitally you know that remastered the tapes and everything to put them out i mean i heard it sound they sound really really good so it's um you know but it, that whole yeah driving up there in a van and it was that like winter <laughs> freezing cold and you know yeah it's good good days the good old days the good old days and how times have changed we're here headlining monsters of rock in sao paulo and i'm running free yeah i'm running free <laughs> that's what i grew up with <laughs> At the press conference, I, I, I actually I'm not surprised to say this because I found it with other bands who've had members that left. But people kept wanting to ask you about what Bruce was doing and what Adrian was doing, and is that a little bit frustrating that they seem to sort of keep going back, sort of five years or whatever? No, it's just that after time we don't know what they're doing. <laughs> <laughs> it's just uh, you know because they're obviously doing their own thing. We're out been out in a row for a year or whatever, so after time we don't know exactly what they're doing at the moment anyway. But. Uh, yeah, it can be. I mean, obviously, you expect them sort of questions, so, uh, you know. But, I mean, Blaze has been in the band three years now, so yeah, it's, you know, time flies, I suppose. But, uh, yeah, I mean, we obviously prefer to talk about what we're doing now. Of 
Um, but then when we're doing a Best of the Beast album coming out, you know, expect to be asked about the history, and so it's, it's you know, normal. Maybe when they go out as well on their promotion tour, they probably ask them about Maiden. So it kind of, you know, if we just, you know, it just goes around full circle anyway. Now we're here in um, Brazil, which is one of your most successful territories, um, uh, but it's not so going so well in the UK. Now, why why do you think that is, and how do you feel about it that your home country isn't such a strong territory as it used to be? Well, it's maybe not as strong, but I mean, if, you know, we still had a top 10 album, a top 10 single, so um, we sold out a tour that we had. So, um, you know, I think um, the UK, same as the US, is that, you know, really it's kind of a media and vogue thing uh, that's happening at the moment. I mean, the rest of the world, we're as strong as we ever were. So it's, I mean, UK and US tend to be kind of uh, governed by, you know, whatever is happening with the fashion or whatever. And we've never been particularly fashionable. But, um, you know, we're still, we're still strong, we're st but uh, just maybe not as mega as we were, perhaps. But, uh, you know, at the end of the day, you know, we still go out and do what we do. And if, we, you know, people either accept us or not, I mean, that's the way our always attitude has, has been. So um, they take us or leave us. Absolutely. Well, here at Headbangers Ball, we're taking you because we regard you as a very important part of the show. And uh, we're actually, like I said, we're so happy to be here. So um, we're going to talk to the guys some more uh, in a little while. But right now, um, taking us into our next short break, we're going to check out some more fun and games.
in France. We shall fight on the seas and oceans. We shall fight with growing confidence and growing strength in the air. We shall defend our island, whatever the cost may be. We shall fight on the beaches. We shall fight on the landing grounds. We shall fight in the fields and in the streets. We shall fight in the hills. We shall never surrender. <laughs>
welcome down to the kickoff of the Iron Maiden Video Diary from Brazil. Well, we arrived in Sao Paulo this morning at about 6.30. We've now checked into the hotel, had a little bit of a rest, and it's coming up to 11 a.m. in the morning. And the first thing on Iron Maiden's schedule is a press conference. So let's see what happens. For five years of Iron Maiden, it's a big band. It's the best chance to see Dave Murray and the other Steve Harris, Nick McBrain. Let's see Blaze Billy sing for the first time here in Brazil. <laughs> this gentleman here is Wally and he's Iron Maiden's head of security. So I think he's talking about the uh, security requirements at the gig tomorrow night. Is that actually? Hi Vanessa. Hi. We're just talking about Heaven Can Wait, how the singers go up on stage. <laughs> charming job yes. everyone looks forward to that we'll make, get them backstage right. the second number walk them on the stage and then, the only, we'll yep. move them. And then we'll be moving them back off the stage and then the show goes on as normal Perfect. we have no pyrotechnics the only thing we have is we have two huge monsters one walks on stage and one gets electrocuted at the backstage other than that i don't think we've got anything really much to worry about it's a bit mad here as you can see but Normally it's a quite as mad as this, so it's a good oh, time. Good. So well, you can see Skid Row have just turned yeah. up, and it's actually one cool thing about this festival, all the bands and everybody's staying in the same hotel. So uh, welcome to Sao Paulo. Thank How you. are you guys? Excellent. How are you? Yeah, I'm very well. Very well. Yeah. Aren't you a little far away from home? Yeah, what's well, so are you. <laughs> Absolutely. Good welcome to, see to you. Sao Paulo. Man, orange hair is the yeah. in thing now, know, isn't it? We've all got good. orange hair. I did too, but it didn't take too well. We drove past the stadium on the way here. It looks pretty cool. Yeah, yeah. you seen any shows down here before? No. Nope. Oh, they're great. It's awesome. They're great. It's crazy. Do the kids go absolutely mad? Yeah, they yeah. do. They're like hair pullers, you know? Yeah. <laughs> the day before the festival, and I made have done a press conference. They've done some interviews. And you know what big fans of football they are? They want to go and play football, and they do it in style in a helicopter. They've already gone down to the football ground, so we're going to join them right now. But just take a look, this beautiful view of Sao Paulo. I'm really frightened of helicopters, but can we give it a shot? I'll cross myself. Fingers crossed. outrageous really because uh, you know I can walk around the town where I live and walk down the high street and be completely anonymous and come so far away from home and be instantly recognizable and have gangs of people chasing me from McDonald's So we just came here to see Iron Maiden from Belgium all the way to we stay in Rio de Janeiro came by plane to Sao Paulo and we see them on Monday again in Rio de Janeiro Mayday! Mayday! Iron Maiden gonna get you wherever you are!
on a plane and we're on to the next city. So um, I think Nico's actually in front of me on the plane. Nico, hi, how are you today? Ah, hello, my dear. Very well. Hello, <laughs> boys and girls. How was, how was the gig last night, in your opinion? Oh, brilliant. Abs absolutely fantastic. Uh, I think it was a full house. Yeah, it was. You know, uh, and uh, the kids were brilliant. They'd been they'd been there since like nine in the uh, in the morning. I think the doors opened at three. You know, so they had a long day. We actually got on stage at midnight, and uh, so we weren't quite sure how they were going to react because you know, being at a gig for nine, ten, twelve hours, uh, it's, it's quite heavy. You know, but they went crazy, man. It was brilliant. Yeah. We played we played really pretty, pretty well. Um, a little few problems with some sound here and there, but you know that's when you do festivals yeah. like that. It's sort of like put your hand in the hat and see what comes out. Oh, get lucky and I have a good sound. You know. What book are you reading? Oh, Star Trek Q squared. It's uh, one of the, the. There's I think it's about the fourth book that was written on the series. But uh, and one last question: Are these are these glasses necessary this morning? Uh, yeah, because I'm as blind as a bat when I don't have them <laughs> on. <laughs>
I've not been talking drums, if that what you think. That's what the guitar players over here think that we've been doing, so. <laughs> They've been talking guitars and amps and shit like that. They're just jealous because they can never get... They're just jealous because they can't get to the end of the stage, you know? They want to see the people. They want to smell the breath, you know? <laughs> the twat. The twat guys over there. Yeah, yeah. Okay. It's the a shame cool. now we have to sit behind and watch their sorry asses yeah, all night, yeah. anyway. <laughs> Oi! You've been talking about guitars over there, have you? No way. We've man. been listening to you talk about drums for the last hour and a half. <laughs> <laughs> we haven't been talking about drums. That's classic guitarists. Yeah, Lovely yeah. crowd. That's the rude boy. We Lovely words. Oh, no. We've been on this plane for two hours and it's only nine in the morning. You know? Well, we still haven't gone to bed, that's the thing, you know? Yeah, at least this row has not been sleeping. It's definitely no sleep till we get wherever we're going and do no, whatever we've got to do. No sleep till Hammersmith, but no sleep <laughs> till Rio, I'll tell you that. <laughs> no, tonight be the grande de finale, as I told you before. My birthday uh, grief was uh, pack it in, boys, as I told you. But <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, that's what we were saying, 20 years of maiden, you know, it's an anniversary and all this, and I got here, you old fart, look at you, uh, old bugger. I just want to remind Nico that 
they were together while I was, what, when you started the band, we were about uh, five. I was five, I think. No, I was three. Oh, it got better. <laughs> right now. I was 19 the first yeah, time. Yeah, right, right. <laughs> 18 or 19. He was driving a car, he said, at least. Uh, you know, but no, they do another 20 years, hopefully. Yeah. All right, I have to go and sit down now because we're coming into land, so um, see you later. Hello, birds. I don't know if you can see, but this pollution here is just terrible. There's a thick layer of grey smog sitting over the city, and it's only nine o'clock in the morning. I'm just doing my little diary there which is for the Iron Maiden website. I'm keeping an occasional diary. I'm just writing up about the uh, events of the previous evening. I saw Sebastian back this morning. He looked in a bit of a state, and apparently he hadn't slept because he was up all night talking to Lemmy. <laughs> I saw Lemmy about 10 minutes later. He looked completely normal, as if, and he hasn't slept since he's been in Brazil. So this leads me to think that Lemmy is, of course, superhuman. He's one of these people that has been planted by aliens and he's probably, <laughs> right, he's, he was probably planted in a pyramid 2,000 years ago and, uh, and he's just been going. He's probably 2,000 years old because if you look at any picture of him ever, he's always looked the same. So that's the story of today. Who knows what is going to happen tonight when we're playing in Rio, which is pronounced locally here. <laughs> There's an evil virus that's threatening mankind. That state of the art, a serious state of the mind.
Well, it's the day after the concert in Rio and in just a few hours time we're going to be flying back to London but before I go I'd just like to take this opportunity to tell Iron Maiden that they are one of the reasons that I got into rock music in the first place so a double thanks to them that I finally got a chance to visit Brazil I've had a totally fantastic weekend guys and here's to the next chapter in the history of Iron Maiden well that's it for our best of the beast video diary from Brazil I'm signing off from Rio see ya
But Headbangers Ball is out on the road with Iron Maiden in Brazil. And as you can see, Stephen Davis still with me. And now we're going to take a little bit of time to talk about that lovable Iron Maiden mascot, Eddie. So, Steve, going right back to the beginning with Eddie, how, when and why was he born? <laughs> well, we just had like a, a kabuki mask, really, in the early days in the pubs. And we were trying to put on a bit of a show. You know, uh, we had all sorts of weird, wonderful uh, gadgets going, you know, like uh, bubble machines and all sorts of stuff going on. And we had um, a kabuki mask which used to go above the drummer's head and blood used to come out wouldn't <laughs> go all over his head because uh, there was no else, uh, other place to put it. And uh, it just sort of expanded from there, you know, we had the eyes just light up and a bigger one and smoke come out the mouth. And then when we did the first album, Derek Riggs just expanded on that and so uh, Eddie was born, I suppose. But uh, it's great having Eddie because, you know, he can be on the covers and, and do, you know, loads of different things image-wise in the shows. Yep. And uh, it means that we don't get recognised in Tesco's. So. <laughs> yeah, just send Eddie shopping. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So, um, how has he, like you said, he's developed from a mascot to a stage persona, and you've got a walking Eddie and an Eddie that gets electrocuted and all sorts of fun things like that. Why do you think he's so popular with the fans? So can you put your finger on yeah, it? Yeah, I mean, he's um, been different characters throughout the years. You know, he's been um, he's brought to life, and he's been like a sci fi, like, Terminator type robot and he's been like a mummy, uh, a daddy, <laughs> he's, been, he's been all sorts of things so I think really it's just because he's kind of you know this character and just the growth he looks pretty grotesque this guy but it's kind of like Eddie can do anything yeah. and I think maybe it's sort of relate to because he's like like this creature you know that can actually you know perform anything do anything and I think maybe that's why he's likeable you know. Yeah. But he, I don't really find him scary that's the funny thing. No, I don't think he should be that scary. I mean, he's, he's tongue-in-cheek, a lot of the yeah. stuff that we do with him and stuff. So, but like, you know, it's, 
I think Eddie, you know, is like you say, he can do it almost anything. So it's like it, you know, your imagination can run right with the sort of, you know, whatever. So I don't know. Who knows? Maybe you should ask the fans that one. Yeah. Maybe I could ask Eddie. <laughs> he doesn't do interviews though. Well, uh, actually, Eddie's also got his own computer game called Melt, and we're going to be talking to Blaze about that a bit later on. But right now, we're going to go to the video for uh, Wasted Years.
the uh, helipad of the hotel. It's Blaze from Iron Maiden. So um, lovely to see you again, Blaze. Um, how is life in Iron Maiden in 1996, headlining these Monsters of Rock shows? Uh, maravilloso. <laughs> <coughs> yeah, it's absolutely, uh, it's brilliant. I'm really looking forward to the show tonight. It's, uh, it's going to be the biggest one that I've headlined so far on the tour. But um, everything's been going fantastic so far, you know. Uh, since uh, we last got together in uh, South Africa, it's just been absolutely brilliant. I seem to be singing, I, I can really tell now the difference from when we started off in Israel and South Africa to now with my voice and everything. Yep. It's just, uh, it's so much better. Excellent. Well, I'm going to ask you a little bit about that later on, but um, tonight you're going to be headlining in front of something like 60 to 70,000 rabid Brazilian fans. Mm. Um, now, I would imagine that that does put a tremendous pressure on you personally as the front man. How do you cope with that? Um, I think it's all in preparation really. You know, we've done some really, really good shows and we've done a whole world tour, <laughs> you know, and towards the end of it. So I think if I can't cope with it by now, then I'm not going to be able to. So uh, the most important thing to me is just to learn a few words of Portuguese to say to right. people. So, uh, so that's mostly, you know, just so I can say hello and how are you and all like that. So, um, but I'm just really looking forward to it. Uh, it's not just another gig, it's a really important gig, it's a great big festival and everything, but it's, we're just going to approach it and have a good time, you know, the most important thing is to have fun and, and, uh, and sing well. Well, we were talking to uh, Steve about Eddie a little bit earlier, and actually um, Eddie has got his own uh, game out now, yeah, and yeah. Um, I was wondering if you could just tell us a little bit about that. Yeah, what's happened is, uh, I mean, Eddie's such a strong character that... Uh, He's been licensed out to uh, a company to make a, uh, a video game, it's a, it's a 3D game, and what happens is you actually chase Eddie through time and space to try and rescue the universe, because um, his, uh, a previous race has littered Eddie's powers throughout the universe and you've got to you've got to get to them before he does and if he gets all his powers back then he's going to destroy everything life as we know it and so uh, basically the game is um it's just keeping track and trying to yeah. get try get, to get eddie all. before he gets you yeah. Yeah, and what happens is uh, you do battle with Eddie in hyperspace, and if you've stolen enough of his powers off him, then you could win. Uh, but if you haven't, then you're just going to get completely destroyed. Brilliant. So, but you can go and fight him at any time during the game and have a look at him. But he's, it's it's quite a tough game. But uh, but from what I've seen of it, we've been down to uh, down to the programmers and we've been having a look at it and everything. So it's really really good. I'm pleased with it. Well, we've got a little competition for you on Headbangers Ball to celebrate the best of the beast, and we've got five goodie bags to give away, consisting of um, Eddie's game, Melt, and some copies of the album, and some T-shirts, and if you want to enter the competition, all you have to do is answer a very simple question, which Blaze is going to set for you now. Okay, on, um, on the album Best of the Beast, we've uh, written and recorded a brand new song that isn't on any other album and it's going to be a single. What is the title of that song? Excellent. Okay, so if you know the answer to that, what is the title of the new song on The Best of the Beast, put your answer on a postcard along with your name, age, address and telephone number and send it to Iron Maiden Best of the Beast competition, MTV's Headbangers Ball.
personal growth. Um, how has it changed you, do you think, as a person and as a performer? Um, well, I think I'm a lot more confident, really, as a performer because uh, I've been accepted by the fans throughout the world now and my singing, my whole technique has improved since, uh, since I started the tour. Mm -hmm. And it's the longest tour I've ever done, so you know, my, my voice is a lot stronger. You know, I know how to approach the songs and how to prepare myself. I've had to more or less completely give up booze. <laughs> <laughs> well, so so that's, that's one thing on a personal note, which uh, you just can't do it. Right. When you're doing a, a set as long and uh, as hard and, and putting as much into it and being as intense to keep your voice and you know go out for a few beers and that it's just not possible right. so uh, so for this whole leg of the tour you know I'm not, I, I can't really drink until the end so it's going to be margaritas in Monterey <laughs> you know on, on the last day. Well that sounds fantastic a bit like a dream come true because we were whizzing around in helicopters and playing football at somebody's private ranch yesterday. Um, have you ever kind of felt your feet coming off the ground or have you, um, have the people around you kind of kept you firmly in place? <laughs> yeah, one, one or two times my feet have uh, come off the ground, but usually everybody just says, well, stop doing that, you big-headed bastard, mm -hmm. and uh, I'm back to normal. Mm -hmm. So uh, so it's been okay. Yeah. But uh, really, this whole part of the tour, I mean, it was really, Japan is a very foreign place and that, that was like, wow, it's a place I would never have imagined going if I wasn't in a band. And it's the same coming to Sao Paulo and Brazil and playing in South America. For me, it's like the part of the dream that you have when you start as a musician, being in a band, oh, on a tour of the world. These are the places that you imagine coming to. Yeah. And so for me, this is really part of living the dream. Fantastic. And just to finish, Blaze, um, how do you see the future of Iron Maiden? Because you've um, written the virus track um, as a kind of group effort. Does that yeah. kind of point to the future for you? Um, well, if you listen to uh, Virus uh, after um, the last studio album, then uh, I think you can really see there's a progression, progression. in the sound, in the, in the confidence of the band. You know, we've worked together for a long time now. So I'm really, really excited about the next studio album. Best of the Beast is coming out. That's, I'm sure that's going to do really well. And then the next studio album, which we probably start recording, writing and recording in January, I just feel it's going to be really, really exciting. So lots to look forward to. Yeah, yeah, All right. really. Well, very nice to talk to you. Thank you for joining us up here on yeah. the roof of the hotel. And uh, have That was the easiest way to rebel. 666, all the way. Fucking... Fly as high as the sun! All that shit. Gotta love it, man. Maiden. 666. The number of the beast! Sacrifice the one for you. And just two or three achievements of the band, what do you think they would be? Um, I think uh, playing Donington for the first time was unbelievable to headline your own country and play in front of that many people, over 100,000 people, was just incredible. That was definitely one of them. Um, I suppose the amount of album sales that we've sold worldwide is fantastic. It's just, again, it's unbelievable. It's like <laughs> success we could never have believed. And I don't know, what about the third one, do you think? Um, good question. It's That's the third one. 20 years later. Yeah, yeah, really, yeah. And also, you know, the achievement of being able to do what you love doing and travelling, you know, actually travelling around the world, going to different countries and just experiencing the whole, you know, different cultures. I mean, that's kind of really satisfying and rewarding, you know. Yeah. yeah. And the fourth one, I suppose, is the fact that we've done it on our own terms. We haven't... Yes. Uh, pandered to anybody who haven't tried to be commercial or doing it. We've just sort of totally been totally selfish and stubborn and done exactly what we wanted to do. So, you know, it's uh, it's perfect, really. The best of album is, uh, I suppose, it's our opinion of what a best of should be. And you're always going to get people who are going to argue. But then I suppose you could argue any any album we do is going to be debatable as to what people like and don't like. And so you only really can go by what you like yourself. So. We've chosen the album that we think is the best, best of. Um, you know, with such a long history and so many albums, it's very, very difficult. It's just the same, in a way, as choosing a set for two hours to go and play on the stage. Um, all you can do is um, be a little bit on the selfish side and pick what you think is right. Well, I suppose from fairly early on I wanted to um, play, you know, sort of fast, aggressive music but with lots of time changes and lots of armies, um, which the armies really like the influence of Wishbone Ash, 
a lot of people thought it was like Finn Lizzie, but I mean, like Lizzie as well, you know, but um, Wishbone Ash was really the, the main sort of um, influence. But uh, yeah, just to play like loud, brash kind of music, fast music, but with, with uh, loads of melody in it, um, with interesting uh, time changes. <laughs> Came about um, just purely because uh, you know I, I'd left the band that I was in, Bank called Smiler, and uh, purely because they didn't want to play my songs, they thought it was too many time changes, and they were more sort of R&B based. And um, so I was really thinking, oh, I'm going to call a band, you know, you know, it's probably the most difficult thing, really. Um, and uh, you know, we're just banding names about, and that came up, came up in conversation. I thought, oh, that's a great name, you know. The making of the first album was uh, a nightmare, really, because we, I mean, it was our first attempt at recording an album, um, working with somebody that we didn't know anything about, really, or didn't, uh, they didn't know anything about us. And um, we ended up pretty much well producing it ourselves with, and thank God, the engineer, uh, Martin Levine, was, was really good. You know, overall, I mean, for the first album, I thought, it, you know, I mean, there's some really strong songs on it. Because I suppose they were sort of like a best of of the songs we'd written over the previous four years. So um, it was a strong album. We didn't really, really take too much notice of the term New Wave of British Heavy Metal to start with because um, it it was a thing that seemed to be started by the media or whatever and, you know, we were sort of lumped in with it. And first we didn't really know what to make of it really, but um, then as it started becoming more and more of a big, bigger thing, um, you know, they were talking about lots of lot more different bands that we not, not even heard of from up north or whatever and stuff like that. And then the start, a gig started happening where we would actually do gigs with these bands from all over the country or whatever, which is really exciting, it started becoming a bit of an exciting scene. And uh, we, we weren't really that aware of these other bands, only other that, the, the fact that maybe one or two of them used to advertise in the movie maker, like in the club calendar or something like that, and we might have seen the, the name but not knew much about them, and then you'd see the odd review or whatever, and, and gradually this whole sort of thing started happening. And it became really exciting, and uh, we started doing gigs at the Music Machine with various bands. And, um, you know, the whole scene started happening with like, Saxon and Samson and Angel Witch and ourselves and Praying Mantis and people like that. And uh, the whole thing started happening, it was really very exciting and it was good to be part of it, you know, we sort of uh, didn't mind at all. The first album we would have used Martin Birch on that and funny enough he said, why didn't you call me? And we said, well, to be honest with you, I mean, he produced you know, some, you know, quite a few of our favourite bands. Um, people like Deep Purple and White Snake and people like that, Black Sabbath and, and stuff. And we thought, well, he's just this, you know, top dog producer, and we can't, you know, we're not sort of worthy, really, you know. Um, but uh, I wish we had called him because he was definitely up for it. I think Martin was very important um, for quite a lot of years. I mean, obviously, he was involved with most of the Maiden albums, really, and uh, it was, you know, I mean, he was like part of the family, really. I mean, whenever we did a new album, it was, Martin was going to be doing it. It was just. just matter of course really. Especially in the UK where we really sort of, you know, the big hit single run, it was a number, you know, the seven single run, it went straight in number one and all that, which is fantastic. And uh, obviously, you know, we changed from Paul Deanna to Bruce as well, which is worrying, and then to come through as very, very strong like that was, was really good. And um, it did really well worldwide. And I think we'd already done a lot of touring anyway, uh, especially across Europe. And um, so we'd already built a very big fan base. I like to think that we understand um, 
the fans to a certain degree. Um, I think, you, you know, um, being a fan yourself and going to see bands and not knowing what I wanted to see from a band or, or even from a band or from, you know, what I wanted to get from a band was like, you know, with the other, with some of the album covers and everything else. I think it's uh, definitely uh, helps in trying to understand, you know, what a fan wants. <laughs> It said, you know, would say, would, might say, maybe Iron Maiden isn't relevant in the 90s with all the new bands coming through. What would you say to that? 
Um, rubbish. <laughs> really, re really repeatable, isn't it? <laughs> no. I mean, the thing is, we're, you know, we're still able, we're still selling a lot of albums, and we're still, hey, we're in Brazil, we're playing, you know, sold out football stadium. So, I mean, I think it's very relevant, and I think, um, you know, we still have a, a lot to offer, you know, in the music and everything. And, you know, I still think we've got a while to go yet. And, um, and the thing is, we, you know, we're just going to keep going to, we, you know, enjoy ourselves, really, and have fun, you That's know. That's the most important thing. And you know what? It does say it all. If you're selling out 70,000 people here, you don't need to really even answer that question. Yeah, but I have wanted to ask it. <laughs> yeah. Even if we weren't, I mean, uh, you know, even if things did go to the point where we were, you know, not selling out so many places and stuff like that, we'd, we'd still, if we were still enjoying ourselves, what yeah. we're doing, that we'd still carry on, because that's what we started in the first place for. Absolutely. So uh, it's got nothing to do with the, the money or anything like that. Um, and people can believe that whether they want, but, you know, whatever. I mean, we're here because we enjoy it. And we'll stop when we want to stop, not when someone else thinks we should. Absolutely. And now that you've been, you have been going, as we've been saying, for, for 20 years, it's actually crossing two or three generations. Do you think um, that there's something um, for younger fans in Iron Maiden, as well as the fans that have, sorry, <laughs> have been with you all the time? Yeah, um, in fact, it's quite interesting to see some of the shows because the, you know, like the younger fans, the ones put, maybe seeing Maiden for the first time or at the front, and it kind of, it, the older they are, you know, so the older guy is sent to stand at the back now. <laughs> so, um, yeah, so, yeah, yeah so, you know, a few generations generations there and I think you know they're just enjoying it they're growing with the band and especially like the best of the beast if it's, if it's their first album kind of gives them an overall picture yeah. of everything that we've done you know and um, and I think you know a lot of these young fans have got favorite albums some of their favorite ones go right back to the early days anyway so um, they kind of tend to stick with you over the years you know I think Time. 